السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Alright guys, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله حمد كثيرا طيب ونبارك فيه والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين أجمعين. As always, we begin by praising Allah سبحانه وتعالى and sending our peace and blessings on the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم. Uh, I do ask you to excuse me today. I think I was outside working a little bit, so I'm going to have uh, some allergies uh, that will kind of be ongoing. So if I step off, uh, move off the camera a little bit, uh, please forgive me for that, inshallah. All right, bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim for our Jum'ah uh, message today. I want to talk a little bit about, of uh, again, just listening to people in the community asking questions and some of the concerns that people have. Uh, one of the, the the worries that people have right now is about uh, spending Ramadan away from the masjid, uh, not being able to go out and meet with family, not being able to go out and 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 you know have that that community feeling uh, that we do in the masjid, having those iftars as a community, having parties with our friends and families, even. Uh, but kind of that anxiety that comes with, you know, this is a big. Uh, you know, big time of the year that we look forward to. We've planned for it. We've got a lot of things that are that are kind of uh, set out for you know for Ramadan in our community and our service, etc. And now we can't do all of that. And so we're so used to spending Ramadan a certain way that now it becomes a little bit of a of a worry. It makes us a little anxious that we have to now uh, not have that interaction. And so that can cause some grief in some people as well. That can cause people to be upset and sad about uh, about this. Uh, there are tons and tons of other reasons right now why people are going through some uh, anxiety and some grief. Uh, people are losing uh, family members to uh, the virus, for example. There are people that are sick or their family members are sick. Uh, there are people that are constantly worried about their family and friends that are, uh, you know, uh, doctors and nurses that are, you know, first responders out there dealing with a lot of situations. There are people that have... Uh, a lot of anxiety because they're isolated, right? So they're not used to this, or it's not good for them to be so uh, so isolated, or it's not safe for them uh, at some at some point in time to be this isolated or isolated with the people that they are, et cetera, et cetera. The reasons why people are feeling anxiety and grief and worry and concern in this time are many, right? There are many, uh, and uh, some it, it does have to do with the the fact that we have the situation that we do that's causing. Uh, a lot of these other concerns and 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 uh, gray areas for uh, for people as well. So I thought I'd uh, touch up a little bit uh, on on uh, from a religious perspective, what we have in our texts of difficult times or going through periods of anxiety, worry, etc., uh, and how these are uh, these are things that you know they're they're meant to happen to us throughout our lives, uh, but the reason they're they're meant to happen to us is not. Uh, because you know you, you you are being oppressed or punished or or you know or God is angry with you you know there there are many reasons why people go through different things but you know these these things are at the end of the day meant to happen to us and part of that is to build us up to be stronger better people and so that we can face even more difficult challenges or help others through their challenges as well there are many wisdoms uh, behind why we go through difficult times and these difficult situations but I want to share uh, first and foremost. Quickly, what the Quran and Sunnah say about uh, difficult times. What the Quran and Sunnah say about things that that befall us that we uh, don't like happening 
to us. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, وَلَنَبُلُ وَنَّكُمْ بِشَيْءٍ مِّنَ الْخَوْفِ وَالْجُعِي وَنَقْسِمْ مِّنَ الْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَنفُسِ وَالْثَمَرَاتِ وَبَشِّرِ الصَّابِرِينَ So Allah Azza wa Jalla is stating a fact here, stating a way that, you know, a nature of our existence, something that's going to happen to us. So He says, and we will surely test you, try you, meaning all of you, every single people, every single person, بِشَيْءٍ with something, right? And so this is, you know, part of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well. Not everybody's troubles are at the same thing. So not entirely maybe, but things of, the first thing he says is al-khawf. Sorry guys, my connection kind of went in and out. I'm going to pause for a second. Bismillah. All right, the first thing he says that he will test you with is something of fear. Min al-khawfi. And then, wal-ju'i. Hunger. Wa naqsim min al-amwali. A loss of uh, wealth, well, anfusi, loss of life, what tamarat, and loss of fruits. And there, you know, that could be you work hard at something and you don't get the results that you want, or physically as well, uh, you know, your crops. Uh, and by the way, even right now, the farmers in Georgia are having a difficult time, right, because of this, this whole virus. And so he says at the end of it, and give good tidings to those who are sabirin, those who are, uh, you know, defined with the quality of sabr, which we'll talk about inshallah a little bit later. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that you will throughout your life go through something that you're going to experience these different types of things. And again, it's meant to make you a better person. If you haven't been through some type of adversity in your life, you know, you're not really prepared for the actual real uh, you know, situations you're going to come across in, in, in your life. And if you're very, if you were very sheltered, you were always very protected because you had people in your life to, to do that for you there, you know, even that situation is not always going to be around. So we're all going to be tested uh, in, in some capacity with, with hunger, with loss of wealth and lives, with, with fear, we're going to be scared at some point. And these are things that as we say them, we can probably think back to examples in our lives where you know what, we were really scared about something, a situation that was going to happen to us. We were, you know, we, we were worried about where we we're going to get our food maybe at some point in time. There, we did have financial problems, right? We lost someone in our family or in our friends who we loved and it really hurt us uh, really, really bad. And so we've, we can think, you know, throughout our lives, we've kind of gone through these things over and over and over again. But this is just something that's going to uh, going to be expected living this course of life that we have. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in another ayah, in Surah Al-Imran, he, he consoles the believers at the time of the Prophet wasallam because they were in a difficult situation, right? So they believe in Allah, they are the faithful. And again, this idea that just because you're a person of faith, you're not going to have difficulties or worry or anxiety and all this kind of stuff, that is completely not true. Allah clearly tells you He's going to try you and test you, right? And this is to, uh, specifically to the people of faith. But when the community of the Prophet wasallam was experiencing, you know, sorrow, when they were, you know, troubled and they were not you know, they, they weren't really winning, right? At, at the early time when the Prophet ﷺ was kind of the, you know, target for a lot of the disbelievers, Allah Azza wa Jal says, In yamsaskum qarhun faqad masal qawma qarhun mithlu. Wa tilka al-ayyamu nudawiluha bayna nas, wa liya'lam Allahu alladhina amanu wa yattakhidha minkum shuhada, wallahu la yuhibbu al-zalimeen. So even in some of the battles that the Prophet ﷺ had, there was loss of life from amongst the Muslims. The Battle of Uhud, for example, if you read up on the Battle of Uhud, it's it, it was a little it was a frightening experience for the believers because they weren't getting a clear uh, victory. But Allah Subhanahu wa Taala tells the believers, He says in the Quran, if something of harm should touch you, if a wound should touch you, then there has already touched the opposing side a wound or something harmful similar to it. Meaning. You are experiencing loss, they've experienced it as well. And he says, And these days of varying conditions, sometimes you're, you're good, sometimes things are bad, sometimes things are, you know, your life is great, sometimes life is a little scary, right? Everybody goes through it, right? Everybody's going to experience it. Just because you are a Muslim or you have a lot of faith, does not mean you're not going to experience bad times, right? And you look at the Muslim world today, and you can see how some of them are doing well, some of us are, are not doing so well, even within our community, societies, etc. These are times that kind of rotate amongst people. So that Allah may evident, make clear those who believe, 
and may take to himself from among you martyrs. So in, the, in, in, you know, in case there's loss of life because of a calamity, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to take shuhada, wants to grant people this high level. And Allah does not like those who do wrong. So it means just because someone else is putting you in a difficult situation, it's not that Allah is pleased with that person, but the situation itself is something you're going to go through as a course of, uh, of life. And then in the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, in one of his hadith, he said, مَا مِن مُسْلِمٍ يُسِيبُهُ أَذَى شَوْكَةٌ فَمَا فَوْقَهَا إِلَّا حَدَّ اللَّهُ عَزَّ وَجَلَّ عَنْهُ خَطَايَهُمْ كَمَا تَحُدُّ الشَّجَرَةُ وَرَقَهَا In this beautiful hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, that there is no Muslim, there is no believer that is struck by some harm, whether it's the pricking of a thorn or something beyond that, right? And the pricking of a thorn is something that's, you know, it hurts and it goes away, right? You get forever and pricked by a thorn. It's something that you feel and then it goes away, right? So if you're walking in the woods, you get pricked by a thorn. You can walk in the woods and get pricked by hundreds of thorns. And like, you know, you just, it's something you kind of move on with. But even something as small as that, that causes you harm or whatever is beyond that, something greater, right? And we're talking about physical, emotional, whatever kind of harm. Then all of these things are, you know, things by which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when you experience these discomforts, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives you sins. He said, Like the trees, they, the, like the leaves fall from the trees in fall, right? You, so you see how like the trees will shed their leaves and everything. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will just forgive you your sins because of the difficulties you have to go through in life, the discomforts that you feel in life. Uh, feel in life. A more specific hadith, the Prophet وسلم, said, la wasabun, That the believer is not stricken by any discomfort, wala nasabun, nor any kind of anxiety or worry, uh, wala hazanun, nor any kind of grief or sorrow, wala saqamun, nor any kind of sickness, wala adhan, any kind of harm, hatta al hatta al hamu yahumu, even some kind of uh, discomfort or or distress or or concern that they have, illa. Except that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will compensate that person for the, the difficulty, the pain, the emotional pain, the physical pain, etc. that they're feeling, they will be compensated by having their sins forgiven, by having their sins expiated. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the end of the day, He understands and knows of your pain. And He knows that these are times that are going to come and go throughout your life. But he's made it a means for your purification as well. So if you have to experience something that is harmful or something that is causing you anxiety, whatever it is, again, from the slightest bit. So if your anxiety is caused because you're at home and you can't go out, right? And for a lot of us that have the luxury of being at home, uh, you know, that's, that's something, again, you know, people will tell you, like, you should be grateful that you have a home to be isolated in, but still the concern, the anxiety, the solitude is something we have to validate because it is real and it does exist for that person. The, you know, everybody has their own spectrum of difficulties that they that they face and everybody will face some kind of difficulty. Uh, and so whatever it is you're facing, right, even if it's something like that, you're being forgiven of sins. If it's something beyond that, the more difficulty, the more compassion and mercy, the higher your rank is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the difficulties that you have to go through. Now, when it comes to grieving, or understanding that you know we were that we feel sad about something and we need to deal with this now. So what what are some of the ways we can actually tackle the grief that we feel or the anxiety, the concern, the 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 fear that we have? What are some of the ways we can tackle that from a spiritual perspective? There is an, a, a passage of ayat in the Quran in Surah Al Ankabut, uh, the first uh, seven ayat of Surah Al Ankabut or more, uh, Surah number twenty nine, I believe, Surah number twenty nine. Uh, it's a surah that's called the spider, right? Uh, I believe that's the surah, surah that's called the spider. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed these ayat as a, a consolation and a form of comfort to the Muslims at the time who were being tortured in Mecca. So this is these are early passages that came down. The people that are believing in the Prophet wasallam, they're accepting Allah, they're coming to his worship, they're following his messenger wasallam, but now they're being mistreated because of the faith that they that they profess, they're being oppressed, they're being tortured, they're being isolated, all this kind of stuff. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends these passages down as a form of comfort for them. And so one of the things we have to understand is that the Quran is a form of comfort, but it is, you know, it can be a form of comfort in its recitation, but it's an entirely higher level of comfort when you understand the message that is delivering to you. So the ayat that came down 
to specifically comfort the believers. If you understand what's going on, what the message is, then you're really going to get that that comfort. So what is that message? In these first seven verses of Surah, uh, surah number 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألف لام ميم حسب الناس أن يتركوا أن يقولوا آمنا وهم لا يفتنون Do people actually think that they will be left alone because they say we believe and that they will not be tested? So from the very beginning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sets out the expectation that the first thing you need to realize is that you, you need to expect that there's going to come a point in your life uh, and over again these are days that alternate between between people where you're going to be in difficult situations. You're going to have some discomfort, some concern, some worry, some anxiety. This is this is to be expected. So did people actually think that just because they say we believe that they will not be tested? And this is exactly the opposite of what uh, people tend to tell other people uh, when they don't have enough knowledge and they say, you know what, if you are a true believer, you cannot be depressed. If you are a true believer, you cannot have worry, anxiety, etc., the opposite is being told. Allah is saying, do you think that just because you say you believe, you're not going to have any kind of difficulty? You're absolutely going to have difficult. In the Muslim, this is how everybody's life is going to be. This is an expectation. I can't imagine that I will have a life that will not have these kinds of worries, except in the next life, right? Except in the in the akhirah. And then he says, وَلَقَدْ فَتَنَّ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ اللَّهُ الَّذِينَ سَلَقُوا وَلَيَعْلَمَنَّ الْكَاذِبِينَ Allah says, even those that came before you, righteous people that came before you, prophets and their followers, they were tested, they were tried, so that Allah could make clear who are those that are true in their claim of faith and who are those that are just kidding themselves, who are those that are just uh, lying. And so this is a test, right? A lot of times these things, they are a test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and a test means you are now getting to put your skills to the test, right? You you have something, you are capable of doing something, that's why you're being tested. And so now you're going to put those skills uh, to, to use, the things that you already know. So meaning you're not being tested with something that you cannot pass. A test is always, you know, people go through their, uh, you take a class in college, for example. Every time you have that final exam, even though you've been studying that entire subject the whole time, you're being prepared for that exam. But when it comes time to take the test, everybody gets anxious, they get scared, they get a little bit worried, they're a little bit confused, I hope I do good, they're praying. Why? Even though they've been doing exactly what they need to do, they've been given the things they need to pass the test, the fact that you're faced with, with, with putting your skills and knowledge to, to, uh, to the test is a scary perspective, right? But the fact is we understand this. So if we're being tested by Allah with something, then we know that Allah Azza wa Jal has already made us capable of doing good and passing the test. We just need to now uh, get over that hurdle of actually taking it. And then he says, And do those people who do evil things actually think that they can escape us, escape Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? It's not going to happen, right? Basically, that's not going to happen. So if your anxiety or your grief is the product and result of somebody else's oppression, somebody else's violation of your rights, somebody else's aggression, then you can be rest assured that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not going to let that person get away with it. They're going to have to face the responsibility of what they're doing to you at one point in time. Allah's timeline is the timeline, but it's not that Allah is sitting there and, and ignoring or unaware that you are being harmed by somebody else. If, if your worry and grief is associated with some other person, then that person is going to be dealt with by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at some point in time. It's not that they're going to get away with what they've done. And then he goes back to the person that's afflicted. But whoever is hoping for the meeting of with Allah, right? So again, in the Akhirah, we're gonna we understand that this life isn't it. We have a next life. We're gonna be resurrected, and we're gonna stand before Allah. Whoever it is that hopes for that next life with Allah, hope that meeting with Allah, then that time will definitely come. It's already on its way. Uh, and when you go meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will already know everything. He hears everything. He knows everything. He's going to be well aware of what it is that you meet him with. And then he says after that, and whoever strives and struggles. So now you, he knows that you have to put some effort forward. You have to, you know, it hurts a little bit. You have to do your... Uh, you have to go beyond what you would like to do. وَمَنْ جَاهَدَ Whoever is struggling, فَإِنَّمَا يُجَاهِدُ لِنَفْسِهِ Then they are struggling for their own good. 
And so you're in this situation and you have to struggle, that struggle is going to produce benefit for you, right? That struggle is going to make you stronger. It's going to make you more experienced with this. It's going to make you more educated about what you have to do. And that's the word jihad that's being used here. But in the mayujahidu li nafsihi, these people they're they're striving for the benefit of themselves. In Allah laghaniyun an al alamin, you're not going to benefit Allah from this. Allah is free of need, but He has He has made this a process by which you become stronger, you become better as a person. وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ لَنُكَفِّرَنَّ عَنْهُمْ سَيِّئَاتِهِمْ And again, the same thing we did in the hadith before. Those who have faith and do righteous deeds, then we will certainly forgive them their sins. وَلَنَجْزِيَنَّهُمْ أَحْسَنَ الَّذِي كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ And we will certainly, certainly reward them for the best that they used to do. And so sticking, you know, uh, sticking to your claim of faith, pushing forward, doing what you're supposed to do, these are the ways we get through difficulties from a faith perspective. And we understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to address that for us and He's going to acknowledge that for us when we meet Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this is one perspective by which uh, a, a tough situation, grief, sorrow, etc. is addressed in the Qur'an for the Sahaba and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa when they were going through extremely difficult, uh, extremely difficult times. And then in another passage in Ali Imran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَا تَبْوَلَا that you will certainly be tested. The same thing. You will certainly be tried and you will certainly be tested. Meaning you're going to have difficulties in these three areas, right? So there's other three areas that Allah mentions here. Fi amwalikum, Financial difficulty. You're going to have uh, issues with your wealth. You're going to be tested in your wealth. Now that could be in a variety of different ways, but you're going to be somehow tested in your wealth. Either you're going to be tested by a loss of wealth or you're going to be tested by having a massive amounts of wealth and what you actually do with it. There are many different ways Allah Azza chooses to test people. وَأَنفُسِكُمْ And you will be tried and tested in your in your bodies, in your souls, meaning your your health, your your well-being, right? And again, there are many ways that you can be tested with that. وَلَا تَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذًا كَثِيرًا And you will certainly have to hear from those that were given the scripture before you and those that are disbelievers, those that are the idol worshippers. And again, in, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, these are the people that are surrounding him uh, in the Arabian Peninsula. You're going to have to hear from other people, other than a lot of harm. So you're going to be tested in your reputation. You're going to be bullied. You're going to be uh, mistreated by other people. Financially tested, your health will be tested. And even other people are going to give you a difficult time in this life, right? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lays down that expectation that this is going to happen. This is what happens in life. And then he says, well, in tasbiru. But, and here's the, here's the cool thing. In tasbiru, if you can have sabr, right? And again, I do not, I don't use the English word patience for sabr. And I'll explain what it is in a second. Well, in tasbiru, if you have sabr, and if you have taqwa, فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Then that is from, you know, the uh, the determining factors of, of your success. That is going to be what's going to get you through any kind of difficulty. And so uh, when you're tried and troubled with any kind of situation, two components that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, sabr and taqwa. Now from a faith perspective, again, it's it's these aren't things that have no skills associated with them. These aren't just empty concepts, right? These are concepts that you have to utilize in a practical way. So when we say you have to have sabr, it's not just some theoretical concept of patience that, okay, I just have to bear it. You need to know what sabr actually is. You need to know what you do when you're in sabr mode. You need to know what you have to do when you're in taqwa mode, right? Because these are the two things you're, you're asked to do. But if we don't ever define these as practical things to do, then what are they? Really, what are they? They're just words that we're saying we're doing, but we're not actually putting them into action, right? Sabr means restraint. Restraint means to hold yourself back from something that's going to be uh, harmful. So when you're in a situation where things are tough, they're difficult, you're feeling sorrow, grief, anxiety, worry, concern, fear, etc. One of the things you have to do is restrain yourself from anything that is negative in terms of your faith. So negative emotions, negative actions, negative behaviors, etc. You need to restrain from that. So when you're experiencing some kind of financial difficulty, for example, you need to restrain yourself from the haram things that we do financially. Meaning it's not a good idea to take, you know, the $1,000 you have left and go and get lottery tickets and try to now 
win the lottery to better your financial situation. You have to have sabr. So there's sabr and restraint. You're going to hold yourself back from doing that. And then when you do the right thing, that is taqwa. That is what taqwa actually is. Taqwa is being mindful of Allah and being obedient to Him subhanahu wa ta'ala. So one of them is kind of like, you know, negating certain types of uh, practices and the other is initiating certain types of practices. So sabr and taqwa. Restrain from things that are going to be harmful, negative, and act on things that are in obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the determining factors that will get you out of a difficult situation. Now from a faith perspective, there's lots of ways to do that. It's good to get some faith counseling as well to ask you know, your, your religious leaders, this is what I'm going through. How can I be patient and how can I be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this situation? So there are specifics for every situation that you're probably going through. But these are the two components and they're not empty concepts. They're not just words that we throw out there. They're, at, they're steps to each one. So when we, when we tell somebody to have sabr, to have restraint, we're asking them to, you know, uh, not go and do something haram in order to better their situation, thinking that, you know, their situation will be bettered by something that could actually cause them harm, even, uh, you know, spiritually or uh, financially or otherwise. And when we ask them to have taqwa, we're asking them, obviously, to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to repent to Him, to pray to Him, to ask Him for His guidance, but, you know, also to make sure that we're aligning our actions moving forward. How are we dealing with this situation? in ways that are Islamically appropriate. And that is the combination of sabr and, and taqwa. Uh, from the example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, let's have a green tea break. Green tea in a green cup. The old RCM logo, guys. I don't know if you guys remember that. It's the old RCM logo. All right. So those were some of the concepts we looked at. Uh, but let's look at our example of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, he went through many, many things in his life that were extremely, extremely difficult uh, for someone to have to deal with. And again, one of the things I always encourage people to do, read the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, especially at a time when you're experiencing some kind of difficulty, you're going to find an example of the Prophet wasallam either going through the same things, something similar, and, and you know how his reaction was, what did he rely on, or the Prophet wasallam helping others, guiding them in the difficulties they went through in life that are similar to what you're kind of going through. You will find this in the seerah of the Prophet wasallam, uh, and even in the Quran as you kind of read through it. But read through, read these things when you're going through difficult moments and you kind of understand that. But some of the difficult things that you know what would grieve anybody and grieve the Prophet wasallam as well, he was orphaned at a young age, so he lost his father. Uh, you know, when he was very, very young, he knew his mother for, uh, you know, a few years of his life. Then his mother also passed uh, passed away. There was a moment when the Prophet, وسلم, when he first received revelation, the first ayat of the Quran that came down, and there was something called Fatratul Wahi, meaning then nothing came down of revelation for quite a while. So revelation came down. It was an, an amazing experience, some, you know, frightening, scary, but also being revealed to my uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then it paused for a, a long time as well. And that also grieved him because he had no idea, you know, why this was uh, this was happening. When him and his people were boycotted, they were forced into isolation. This was something the Prophet, that grieved the Prophet ﷺ because so many people were suffering uh, because he chose to hung on to his belief as well. And so this was something that obviously weighed heavily on his uh, on his heart. When his wife uh, Khadija radiallahu anha died, it was, and his uncle uh, Abu Talib, who wasn't a Muslim, but who was his form of, you know, a protection. When they died in the same year, that year was called in the books of Sira, Amul Huzn, the year of sadness, the year of grief, right? So the Prophet ﷺ experienced many difficulties because he lost his his uh, his um, protection from his uncle, his tribal protection, and then he lost his comfort that he had in his wife, uh, radiallahu ta'ala, Anha. He was, uh, you know, kicked out and obviously had to leave the city of Mecca. The Prophet ﷺ was not happy about having to leave Mecca. And he, even as he was migrating, as he was leaving, he turned and he spoke uh, to the city of Mecca and said, I would not leave had these people not made me leave, right? So he didn't want to leave his, uh, his hometown. He was mocked. There were assassination attempts. There were, you know, many attempts where he was physically uh, assaulted and, and, and beat. He was obviously what we would refer to as just you know, mistreatment and, and bullying to the, to the highest extent. His reputation, you know, they're calling him a madman, a sorcerer. The reputation of his family was attacked. The lies against Aisha radiallahu anha and other things. So many things that he had to go through, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
that really, really grieved him, right? But we look in the books of Sirah for, you know, how did the Prophet ﷺ actually cope with all of this? How did his companions cope with all of this, right? And it was through these two components, that sabr and that taqwa, right? Sabr and taqwa, meaning their actions were representations of restraint and staying within the bounds of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, wanted them to do. Some interesting examples uh, of some more relatable things uh, from the Prophet's life, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In uh, Al-Mustadrak of Imam Al-Hakim, he mentions a narration from Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu. He says, Zara Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qabara ummihi. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam once visited the grave of his mother. Uh, and the parents of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam were not, uh, were not on, uh, on, on Islam, right? They didn't get the message. They were not on this religion of Islam. So, Zara Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qabara ummihi. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam visited the grave of his mother. Fabaka wa abka man hawlahu. And he cried. And he cried so much that it made those around him that were with him as he was visiting the grave of his mother, uh, they also cried as well because they saw the Prophet ﷺ crying and, and he was saddened. ثُمَّ قَالَ أَسْتَأْذَنْتُ رَبِّي أَنْ أَزُورَ قَبْرَهَا فَأَذِنَ لِي The Prophet ﷺ said, I asked permission of Allah. I asked permission of my Lord, Rabbi, that I, should, that I would be allowed to visit the grave of my mother. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave me permission. Now what was happening here was early on, because of the beliefs and the, rit uh, the rituals and the religion of the, the polytheists of, of Mecca, visiting graves was prohibited. Visiting the graveyard and the graves was prohibited. But the Prophet ﷺ, again, he's a human being, the grave of his mother. He wants to visit it, but he doesn't because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala hasn't given this permission yet. But he says, I asked my, uh, Allah for permission to visit her grave. فَأَذِنَلِي He gave me permission. وَاسْتَأْذَنْتُهُ أَنْ أَسْتَغْفِرَ لَهَا فَلَمْ يُؤْذَنْلِي I asked him permission to ask forgiveness for her, but that was not permitted for me. Right again because of uh, of uh, not being a part of uh, or a believer in, in, in Islam. Falam you then and it was not permitted for me. Then he said, Fazurul Kabur or Qubur, then I I tell you all to visit the graves for inna to the Maut because they will remind you of death. And this was how the permission to visit the graves and, and your families in the graves was given religiously after a period of time had gone by to distance people from these beliefs that they had about the dead and the graves and the graveyards, etc. But you see the 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 human the humanity and the nature of the Prophet وسلم, that when he visited his mother's grave, Baka wa abka man hawlahu, that he cried and he cried so much that those that were around him also cried. And you know, you can you can get a sense from this hadith what you know the Prophet وسلم, felt about his personal relationship, his situation, you know, growing up without his mother, without his father, right? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And these were things that he had to live with an experience, and this is much later in his life that he's visiting his mother's grave. Years and years have gone by. He's a prophet now. This is after you know his migration to Medina because of the, his mother actually died when he was on his way back from Medina to Mecca when he was just a, a young child with her. But he cried. He cries, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as he and then he that permission is given for all of us to visit our uh, our families. And so one of the ways we deal with grief is by crying. One of the ways we deal with our sadness and our emotions is by crying. And that is an established sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ in difficult situations based on this hadith and another hadith in which he had to bury his son Ibrahim. The Prophet ﷺ had children. His only surviving children were his daughters. His sons didn't survive. And they were young and they passed away when they were toddlers, infants, when they were very young. And when he was burying his son Ibrahim, he, as he's burying him, he's crying, uh, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He's crying so much, his beard is wet, the ground around him is wet. He's crying because he has to bury his son. And he says, he says these beautiful words. He says, Tadma'ul Ainu, the eye sheds a tear, the eye is full of tears. Qalbu, the heart is filled with sadness. But we are not going to say except that which is going to be uh, pleasing to our Lord. Excuse me, guys. All right, these allergies again to me. Woo, alhamdulillah. So he says, my, you know, the eye is filled with tears, the heart is filled with sadness, but we are not going to say anything except that which will be pleasing to our Lord. And so this is where the sabr and taqwa comes in. You're absolutely allowed to grieve. 
he was crying وسلم, he's expressing what he's feeling he's expressing the physical things that he's feeling his eyes are filled with tears his heart is filled with sadness but at the same time that taqwa comes in and he says but I'm not going to say anything I'm not supposed to. I'm only going to say the things that are going to be pleasing to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even in this very difficult time. And at the end of the hadith, he said, Wallahi inna bika ya Ibrahim, uh, ya Ibrahim la mahzunun. And he says, I swear by Allah. I swear by Allah. Oh Ibrahim, he's talking to his child that he's burying, right? He's talking to the child that he's burying. Oh Ibrahim, uh, you know, I we are all extremely saddened and his he's... He's testifying to this sadness by swearing to Allah. So, in uh, Ya Ibrahimu la Mahzunun, we are extremely sad. Wallahi, we are very, very sad that we have to, you know, bury it. So, the Prophet ﷺ, part of the sunnah of grieving is allowing yourself to cry, is expressing the things that you are actually feeling uh, to the people around you, having them share in your. Uh, in your grief and allowing them to, you know, allowing yourself to cry with others and and to share that grief with others as well. And I share these two hadith because they show you the that the Prophet وسلم, even demonstrated for us, for us, you know, that it's okay to grieve in, in some of these ways that we that we naturally tend to grieve as long as we stay within the bounds. Don't say things that are you know that are outside the teachings of our faith, etc., etc. This is where that sabr and taqwa comes in. But it's not against. Uh, you know your faith or your religion to grieve it's not it's not against your faith to express how you're feeling to express that sadness and to share that sadness with those that are uh, that are around you and so when we talk about actually grieving one of the important things to even understand from these hadith is don't grieve alone the prophet ﷺ, when he was boycotted was still with his family and his followers right when he's migrating from makkah to medina he stay he has abu bakr radiallahu anhu migrate with him so he doesn't migrate alone sallallahu alaihi wasallam you know even if you're, you don't have the company of other people you know that this is where you turn to the quran where allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is like i am with you you know i am always with you allah is always watching you he sees everything he hears everything and not just that other creations of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are also constantly around you this past tuesday we talked about our belief in the angels the angels are always always constantly with you there are angels that record your deeds angels that protect you from harm and angels that whisper good things to you to encourage you to do uh, good things you're constantly even surrounded by you know, uh, angels of Allah that are obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are never really truly alone. But, you know, as much as you can, don't grieve alone, right? So even in this time, with the situation that we have, you know, call somebody up, text somebody, you know, get on Zoom or Skype or or, or uh, WhatsApp or whatever it is. But if you're feeling isolated and you're feeling some kind of grief for whatever reason, try and connect with other people, right? And if really those... those uh, connections to other people have been cut off then you still have the connection with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and you know Allah azza wa jal doesn't ever take that away no one can ever take that away from you but out of Allah's mercy he you know he will place people in our lives that we can rely on uh, and 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 trust in as well another part of grieving is also take care of yourself uh, meaning do not let yourself uh, don't let yourself go basically you know make sure you're you're eating you're drinking you're one of the ways to help uh, through difficult times is to create some kind of a schedule stick to it have somebody else hold you to it you know especially right now make some kind of a schedule where you're doing stuff in a specific order right keeping yourself busy it keeps your mind busy helps you to get you know move uh, throughout your day uh, but it's okay by the way to make part of that schedule a time where you can grieve and allow yourself to feel uh, the sadness that you're feeling we're not trying to ignore the difficulties that we have we're trying to get through the day in the best possible way that we can and it's okay for us to acknowledge uh some of what we're feeling as well and it's also important to understand that you know grief or sadness or you know fear all it doesn't just go away it doesn't disappear there's no you know magical cure for it you know this it's not like it's going to be there but it's how you deal with the situation that you have dealt to you right now what it's going to do for you, inshallah ta'ala, is going, it's going to make you a stronger person, a better person, having gone through this kind of difficulty. One of the main things we need to understand about difficult times is that we are being uniquely positioned to help other people because we're being put in, in these difficult situations. Inshallah, when we get out of them, when we go through them, when we experience them, we are now in a unique situation where we can provide assistance, guidance, and help to others that will go through that same situation. Again, the first ayah, one of the first ayat I shared with you guys, These are days of you know good conditions, bad conditions. 
these days alternate between people. Sometimes they're going to hit you, sometimes they're going to hit somebody else, and you're going to be in a better situation. But you having gone through that bad situation can now be of assistance to that person. And you can also reach out to other people who may be in a good situation right now, but may have been where you are, uh, you know, at some point in their lives. And so there's a wisdom behind why we go through a lot of these things that we go through. And also at the end of this, just as a clarification, it's important to understand that when any kinds of, uh, any, any of these feelings go to an extreme, so grief, sorrow, anxiety, fear, etc. Any of these negative feelings, when they go to an extreme and you cannot get through your day, uh, you have an intense feeling of guilt, for example, uh, thoughts about dying, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're physically getting sick and you're not able to kind of uh, take care of yourself, etc., etc., that's also a time to seek actual help, professional help, meaning so we need to go and contact, uh, you know, your doctor, uh, first and foremost, you know, talk to a counselor or a therapist, if you need to reach out to somebody and say, look, I really do need help. What kind of help do I need? A doctor is a good place to start. They should have those resources as well. Your doctor should have those resources as well. But you know, just because you feel that 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 difficulty in your life doesn't mean you can't try to tackle it. But once it gets extreme and, and you know you realize that you can't do this on your own, it is absolutely incumbent upon you to ask for help, seek help. And inshallah, you can even start just by contacting your uh, you know religious leaders here at the Masjid. We have a lot of resources that are available to us that we can, uh, inshallah, guide everyone to. Uh, and even if it's just you need an ear to talk, uh, you know, to, to listen uh, to some of the things that you have to say, those are available as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this time uh, you know, beneficial for us, maybe understand that, you know, whatever difficulty, grief, sorrow that we have to go through is number one, an expectation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but is also something we are prepared to handle. And we just have to dig deep down inside, uh, talk to people and understand how we can handle those things. But these are things that we can absolutely tackle in our lives. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to improve our situations and allow us to use these experiences that we've gone through to benefit others as well. Jazakumullah khair, guys. That is the message I wanted to share with you guys today. Uh, inshallah, we're going to have our regular session on Sunday. And next week, the 18th of April, Saturday, 11 to 1, we're going to have our Ramadan workshop with Sheikh Yasser Burjas, Ustad Fatima, inshallah, Dr. Asim Kidwai, and Sister Yaqutullah, as well, our, the nutritionist in our community. So we're going to have these people join us and share with you guys some really important uh, tips and inshallah some resources as well that will help you get through uh, Ramadan particularly if we're going to be experiencing a Ramadan that's going to be uh, more isolated and as somebody messaged me earlier today you know they said just make the intention for i'tikaf for you know seclusion inshallah we're already isolating at home may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept that uh, as our intention that we isolate ourselves in, uh, in worship to him inshallah ta'ala if you guys have any questions or comments or things you wanted to, to add on Use that comment function and share, inshallah, and we will address it. Also want to remind everybody that, uh, you know, one of the important things that we're doing as a community still is providing for um, the, the needy in our community. And so please keep your donations to Sadaqa and Zakat and the Masjid going uh, because we really do need to make sure that we are uh, meeting these needs of our community, especially in this time when some people are, are not able to work. They still have to pay rent or get groceries for their families. I think we shared a, a graphic on our Facebook or Instagram uh, earlier today, uh, showing people how we are using uh, these, these funds right now and what we're able to do for the community, inshallah. Will the workshop be here on FB Live? Inshallah, the workshop will be on our YouTube channel uh, live. We're going to do it through Zoom, but it'll be on our, on our YouTube channel. But the link will be posted on our Facebook, so you guys should be able to access it from, uh, from here as well. What are some ways to comfort people during this time? You know, so if you if you know people, uh, you know, your friends and family, just reach out to them as much as you can. Call them, 
set up these online meetings, do uh, do like a lunch or dinner over Skype or Zoom or something. Staying connected to people, that, that human-to-human -human touch is extremely important, extremely important in coping with uh, anxiety, sorrow, stress, etc. That's why the Prophet, by the way, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is a beautiful hadith, uh, extremely, extremely, uh, you know, a hadith that, that people just kind of tend to, to gloss over. But it's the hadith that, that talks about the rights a Muslim has over uh, another another Muslim and it's the hadith where he says uh, the rights of a Muslim over another Muslim are five or in one hadith uh, he said uh, uh, six uh, let me pull it up here uh, really quickly I'll make sure I get it right Yeah, this is the hadith. So, حق المسلم على المسلم خمس. In one of the hadith, it says uh, there, there are five. رد uh, salam. So, when somebody says salam alaykum to you, that you return their salam, that is a right you owe to the other person. عيادة uh, المريد. That when somebody is sick, that you go and visit that person. Now, right now, if somebody has COVID-19, you don't want to go and physically visit them, but you can still visit them over uh, the means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has provided us to do so. وَتِبَاعُ is Following the funeral procession, Ijabah to da'wa, responding to an invitation when somebody invites you. Again, right now, let's put a hold on those invitations. But let's keep those invitations online, inshallah. With the al atis and when somebody sneezes and they say, Alhamdulillah, that you respond to that person when you hear them say, Alhamdulillah, with, Yarhamukallah, may Allah have mercy on you. And these five things, by the way, are, are is that human-to-human -human interaction, these, these rights that somebody else has over you. And you can imagine, why would the Prophet... Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned responding to a sneezing person's dua as a right that they have over you, right? But it's it's about encouraging people to have that human-to-human -human interaction and to not let people feel isolated. So when somebody says salam to you, you don't say salam back to them. That hurts the other person, right? And that actually makes people angry. It's like, they didn't return my salam. They don't even return my salam. And it's rude. It's really rude. If somebody greets you and you don't greet them back, it's a way to isolate other people. The Prophet said, do not do that. It's a right you owe them. If they say salam to you, you say salam back. It doesn't matter how much you like them, how much you hate them, you return their salam. If they're sick, you visit them. You don't just leave them to, you know, misery loves company. We say if they're ill and sick, you go to them because they're feeling isolated and, and they're feeling really bad. Uh, you know, if somebody's a funeral, following a funeral procession, that person's family is likely there. And so they need support because they're feeling sorrow and grief as well. So when you go and join them in that funeral procession, you're helping them, that human to human touch. Ijaba to da'wah, when somebody invites you, Go to their house for that invitation. Why? Because they're they're wanting to make connections with you, and there's no reason. It doesn't matter if you like the person, don't like the person. If they invite you, go and 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 respond to that da'wah. And again, when somebody sneezes, they say Alhamdulillah, make a du'a for them. Yarhamukallah. This hadith is beautiful. It teaches us that some of these basic rights that other people have is that human to human interaction. So that comfort that we derive from other people. Uh, you know, there's many ways. We just need to make sure that we are engaging. Uh, with people as much as we possibly can, and even the most simplest of ways, like responding to them when they when they sneeze. Even in uh, you know just the culture here, when somebody sneezes, somebody should say uh, you know bless you, right? It's just something nice to do and have that human to human uh, touch. Inshallah Taala. Hope that answered your question. Alhamdulillah. Zakumullah khair guys for sticking around. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless your Friday. Uh, make sure you pray Dhuhr. Don't pray uh, Juma. Pray Dhuhr, inshallah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you all immensely. And we will see you guys on Sunday and inshallah on Tuesday, again on Friday, and then on Saturday for the Ramadan workshop as we get ready for this Ramadan. Please make lots of dua. Get up in the middle of the night if you can and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to relieve us of this burden. Zakumullah khair. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.